Okay, so hi everybody. So it's the last lecture, although there is a review session next week, but it's the last lecture. Um, so uh, okay. Um, so it's lecture twenty eight. Um, and uh, today we're going to talk, well, more about uh, Fourier series. And last time we defined what those were, but now we're going to talk about conversions. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you a whole bunch of applications of this. It's really one of the most useful things we learned in the course. And then finally, in the end, I'll, I'll tie it back to some things we learned in earlier chapters. So let me just recall what we did last time. So we, okay, we looked at this vector space V sub pi of functions on this interval minus pi to pi that are real. Uh, with the property that both the function and its derivative are piecewise continuous. And this word piecewise, you know, it's just a, it's a fancy word that just says you can ignore a finitely many points. And you know this vector space contained a bunch of functions that we saw last time, uh, which I'll I'll remind you of in a moment. But on this vector space, we defined an inner product by integration. Um, and then uh, inside this space, uh, there were there were some you know there were a bunch of functions, but there were some particular you know special ones that were the cosines and sines. So you know cosine x, cosine two x, dot dot dot. Or I guess starting with one, that's cosine zero x, and then these functions sine x, sine two x, dot dot dot. There's an infinite family of functions. This form an orthonormal set. in this inner product space. So of course, orthonormal means with respect to this inner product, right? Um, and then uh, using this orthonormal set, we, we, we defined a series associated with every function inside the space. Um, so, um, uh, you know, we, we defined the Fourier series Fs of F to be this infinite series, um, with, which is a weighted sum of sines and cosines. Where these coefficients are very special, you know, these a n's are one over pi integral f of x cosine and x dx from minus pi to pi. And this is interpreted as just being, you know, f inner product cosine and x divided by a norm of cosine and x squared, of course, with respect to that inner product. And uh, bn was the same, but with sines, one over pi integral minus pi to pi, f of x sine and x dx, which is interpreted as being an inner product of f with the sine function, sine and x, normalized by norm of sine and x, norm squared. This is very similar to the projection formula. And, uh, you know, we had this picture associated with this, uh, with with th this inner product space and with the, these, ortho, these, ortho, these orthogonal sets, namely, we had this picture, which was something like, you know, inside V pi, 
sorry, I think my that picture isn't turning out to be very good. Uh, we have these two orthogonal subspaces, the even functions and the odd functions. And inside each one, we have this orthogonal set. So here we have the cosines, and here we have the sines. And we just defined this series. We didn't actually say how it relates to the original function, right? And that's what we're going to do now. We're going to prove that essentially this series is always equal to the function. And that implies that these, this actually acts like an orthogonal basis, infinite orthogonal basis. So let me remind, you know, I'll have some running examples. So let's, let's look at two examples. So example one is going to be the function g of x defined to be the step function. So it's, it's, it's going to be one if x is in zero to pi open interval, zero if x is zero minus pi or pi, and minus one if x is in minus pi to zero. This is very similar to the function, the s of x function I looked in the last lecture except I've defined it slightly differently at the endpoints. So I've defined it to be zero at the endpoints. This will be slightly convenient, more convenient for today's lecture. Okay. It's so almost the same thing, just slightly different at pi and minus pi. This is also a step function. And, uh, you know, the, this function uh, what's its Fourier series? Well, we calculated it last time. So, you know, it was four over pi sine x over one plus sine three x over three plus sine five x over five dot, 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 dot. And, uh, okay, so this is slightly different from last time, right? So slightly different. From the function s of x in lecture 27. And this Fourier series that I computed was in the previous lecture for that function. But I'm claiming that the Fourier series doesn't change. So why doesn't the Fourier series change if I just change the definition at these two points? This is the definition of a Fourier series here in the box. Why does it, why don't the coefficients change when I change the function at two points? Uh, is it because the function is continuous in the interval, so it should continue to the same number at, the, at those two points? In both um, cases? Yeah, so, so this, so, uh, Okay, not quite, but uh, the reason this has the same Fourier series, which I'm not sure if you learned that in calculus here or in Berkeley, but um, uh, but the reason is that integrals don't change if you change one point. Integral is area under a curve, right? And that doesn't change if you change one point. So this has the same Fourier coefficients. This is a general important fact about integration. Integrals don't change if you change one point. Okay, so this is its Fourier series. Um, let me now do one more example. So do, is that okay to everybody? Um, professor, mm -hmm. by, one, by not changing one point, do you mean like the bounds are staying the same? If the area is the same under it, but like... Uh, well, so so what I mean is that you know what are these numbers, right? So the you know what are what is what are these? Uh, okay, so the Fourier coefficients in this series are four over pi, four over three pi, four over five pi, et cetera, et cetera, right? Now those numbers we computed them using this formula in the box here, right? Which is which depends on some integrals, and. Uh, you know, the point is that what is this integral? It's the area under some curve, but area doesn't change if you remove one point or if you change the height at one point. 
Does that does that make sense? Yes. Could couldn't the um, say uh, couldn't the graph like drastically change at one point the point you chose? It could, but the, but the, the, it's one point, right? So if the area under it is always zero, the area under one point is. Oh, okay, zero. okay, okay. Where did you get this picture, by the way? Anyway. Uh, um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, so um, okay. Uh, anyway, um, uh, fine. Um, so 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 let's look at another example. Yeah, that picture is from when I gave my senior thesis talk. I somehow thought I would look better if I had a goatee, but anyway. Um, so here's another example. Let's consider the function h of x equal to absolute value of x on the same interval. So this function looks like this. It's just a good old absolute value function. And it's defined on this interval minus pi to pi. Okay. Let's just compute its Fourier series for concreteness. Okay. Um, so A naught is, okay, one over pi integral of absolute value of x times one dx from minus pi to pi. And this, you know, this is kind of easy, like, okay, so by the way, is this, can anybody tell me if this function is even or odd? It's even. Or, yeah, it's even, right? If you reflect it across the y-axis, it doesn't change. So this function is even. So that means that this integral is just two over pi times the integral from zero to pi. So if you just look at the area under the right-hand side, x dx, and that's just two over pi times x squared over two pi zero, which is two over pi times pi squared over two, which is just pi. So that's the first Fourier coefficient. Any questions about that computation? Okay. Um, well, actually before we get to B's, let's calculate the other A's. So they have the same integral formula, except now of course the integral is a little bit more involved because you have cosine nx in here now. Um, so, okay, again, I can do the same trick, right? This function absolute value of x times cosine nx is even. So whatever this is, it's just equal to twice times the integral on the right-hand side. So here I used that function is even. Okay, so anybody know how to do this integral? What do you do? Yeah, integration by parts. So everyone's, uh, I don't know, favorite or least favorite thing, but shockingly important. When I learned it, I thought it was a cheap trick, but very important. So you do integration by parts, you get that this is two over pi um, x, Okay, I'm just gonna do it, sine n x over n minus integral zero to pi, uh, one times sine n x over n dx. That's what you get if you do integration by parts. Now, sine of zero is zero, and what is sine of n times pi? It's um, oscillating zero and one. Um, well, actually, sine of n times pi is just always yeah. zero. Oh, you're using integers, right? Yeah. So, so this is zero. So, but now there's one more term which has another integral. So we have to do that integral. So let's do it. So now you 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 get a minus two over pi in the front, and in here you now have to do an integral. Integral of sine is minus cosine nx, and you pick up another n, so you get n squared. And now the limits are pi and zero. Okay. And this is just, uh, you know, minus two over pi n squared times minus cosine n pi 
plus cosine zero. Now cosine zero is just one and uh, minus cosine n pi is what? Is it the negative oscillation between one and negative one? That's right, cosine two pi is one, cosine pi is minus one. So this is equal to minus two pi over pi and, or sorry, not two pi, minus two over pi n squared times, um, you'll get minus one plus one when n is even. So, so, so let, let me just write it like this. Uh, so, so, so you'll get, um, uh, yeah, this times two when n is odd and zero when n is even because you'll get minus one plus one. So those are the cosine Fourier coefficients. Any questions about that calculation? Okay. What about the sine cosine? What about the sine uh, coefficients? Can anybody tell me what that is? Zero. Yeah, zero, right? The function's even. Sine is odd, so this product is odd, so this is zero. And so the Fourier series of this function is equal to pi over two minus four over pi times cosine x over one squared plus cosine three x over three squared plus cosine five x over five squared dot dot dot. Okay, so that's another Fourier series. Now, what's the point of this, right? We're, we're just computing these series. We just defined them, but you know, what do they have to do with the original function? So, okay, so this, uh, you know, this is a, um, uh, this was like a major question for probably something like a hundred years. Uh, so it's not actually very easy to figure out what, these series have to do with the function. It took a long time to figure this out, but but the end result is actually very clean. It's something that I'm going to call the convergence theorem. So this is not this is very hard to prove, and it's beyond this course, but it's true. Here's what it says: If you have a function that's in this vector space v pi, then this it's Fourier series always converges. That's a non-trivial statement, right? It's not easy to prove that a series converges generally. And maybe more importantly, it's essentially equal to the function. This is equal to uh, the average of the right and left limits of the function, if x is in this interval, the interior, and otherwise it's equal to the left and right limits of the endpoint. So, okay, now, just, okay, let's remember what a left and right limit is. So right f of x plus equals limit as uh, let's say epsilon goes to zero, f of x plus epsilon. And of course for minus, it's just minus, right? Now, okay, you know, this looks like some annoying thing because left and right limits, but remember if a function is continuous, the left and right limits are the same, right? So this is actually just saying the Fourier series of X is equal to F of X at every point where X is continuous. Okay. 
Okay. So this is kind of an amazing theorem. It says that this thing, this huge class of series always converges and it converges to essentially the correct thing. And the second condition, you know, let me just explain, let me just draw a picture explaining what this is. So the so picture is, let's say you have a function. Let's say this is minus pi and this is pi. And let's say your function does some stuff and maybe has one discontinuity here. Okay, and here is, it's defined, uh, well, or it's defined some, some way, or, okay, I want these points to be actually kind of distinct, so let me. Okay, that, that's not a great picture either, I wanna, I wanna. Uh, yeah, let's, let's say it goes like this, okay? So what the theorem is saying is that uh, the Fourier series will converge to the midpoint. So here it'll converge to, I don't know, maybe the midpoint is here. And at the endpoints, it'll converge to the midpoint of this and this, which maybe in this case, it looks like is somewhere here. Okay. So at every jump, it converges to the midpoint and you just wrap around at the ends. That's what the theorem is saying. Oh, oh, sorry. Well, what does it mean to converge at a midpoint? Is the sum telling us that the earth, like, yeah, what does it mean to converge at, at some point? Right. So, so the way to think about this is the Fourier series is a series, right? It's an infinite series. For every number X, there's an infinite series. Right? Yeah. And whether or not that series converges can depend on X. Yeah. So what the theorem is saying is the series always converges regardless of what X is. And at any particular X, what it converges to is essentially the function F, except if there's a jump, in which case it converges to the midpoint of you know, the function values, the left and right limits. Okay, got it. Thank right, because if there's a jump, then the left limit is not equal to the right limit. That's what a jump means, right? So x minus means you're approaching, uh, or sorry, this is x plus means you're approaching from this side. x minus means you're approaching from this side. And the theorem is saying that the series converges to a number, which is exactly the midpoint. Okay. Wait, um, I have a question. Um, yeah. Like in the previous example uh, for absolute value of x, um, like um, you can't um, differentiate absolute value of X, but like, why wouldn't you be able to like differentiate the Fourier series? Uh, yeah, you would be, and I'm gonna talk about that later. So this is one of the major applications of Fourier series. It lets you differentiate functions that are not differentiable in a meaningful way. But maybe, okay, before I get to that, why is this in V pi? Well, it's because as you mentioned, it's not differentiable at this point zero, but remember V pi is just, uh, f and f prime are piecewise continuous. So you can ignore finitely many points. So you just ignore zero. But I'll get to your question a little bit later. Great question. So let's apply the convergence theorem to our two examples and see what it says. Well, in this case, uh, the convergence theorem is saying It's saying that uh, this Fourier series is equal to one in uh, if x is in zero to pi because it's continuous there, right? Minus one if x is in minus pi to zero. And now you have these you have these two points of discontinuity, right? You have the point zero, and you have the points plus or minus pi. Now, the, what's the average of the left and right limits at zero? Zero? Zero, yeah. So it converges to zero at x equals zero because you know the zero is the average of plus one and minus one, right? And what about at pi and minus pi? Well, uh, zero again. So 
So in a nutshell, in this case, it actually just converges to f of x. Okay, in this in this example. Wait, f of x? Oh, sorry, g of x. Whoops, g of x. Okay. Any questions about that? Let's look at our second example. So again, here, actually, the function is just continuous everywhere, and the left and right limits, the the the, the you know the the right limit at pi is just pi, right? Or f of pi minus. Sorry, got this wrong because you're approaching from the left. Oops. Okay, I'm not sure what's going on. And here, f of minus pi plus is also pi. So this averaging just doesn't do anything. And indeed, by the convergence theorem, you get that the series is equal to h of x. Sorry, this should be h. Function is called h. Uh, for all x in the whole interval. Okay, so you get this sort of amazing identity that this very rough function, or this function that doesn't look anything like a sine or cosine, an absolute value function, is actually an infinite sum of sines and cosines. So I mean, when Fourier proposed this, people thought he was completely crazy because A, he couldn't prove this, and people were just like, how can this possibly make sense? How can you... How, I mean, sines and cosines are these really smooth functions, right? How do you, how can you possibly write this as a sum of sines and cosines? At this point, it's a theorem. And just to sort of convey this to you, I'll show you some, I'll give you a few different demonstrations of this. But before that, any questions about OK, so to show you the demonstrations, I'm going to need one more concept, which is not a deep concept, but which is very useful for visualizing. And also, just if you want to think of this in terms of, you know, as being like a, a wave, a periodic wave. So here's a definition. So a function, uh, let's call it, um, I don't know, let's give it a new name. Let's call it capital F from R to R is called 2 pi periodic if it does what it sounds like it repeats every 2 pi if f of x plus 2 pi equals f of x for every x in r so this is now a function on the whole real line previously we were talking about a fixed interval from minus pi to pi and now we're looking at a function on the real line um and okay, what are some examples of two pi periodic functions? Anybody? Can anybody think of an example? Just like sine. Yeah, sine of x, cosine of x. Any other examples? Tan of x. Uh, tan of x is unfortunately not a function from r to r, right? Because tan of uh, pi over 2 is uh, infinity. A constant? Constant, yeah. Parabolic? Excuse me? Uh, a polynomial? Polynomial? No, that's not going to have this property, right? Like x squared. Right? No polynomial has this property, actually. Some uh, step function that steps up and down every once. Or yeah. Every pi. Okay. Step function. Every every two pi. Yeah. Okay. You have to be a little careful at the endpoints, but maybe if you do this. Oh, sorry. Whoops. Uh, yeah. So. 
Uh, okay, what do you have to do with the endpoints? Uh, let's just do it like this. Yeah, okay. Anything else? A zigzag. Zigzag, okay. I won't draw it, but yeah, zigzag. Fine, I'll draw it. There's a ton of these, but okay. Another one is just go sign NX, right? Or sign NX. So there are lots of these. And you've kind of actually already uh, anticipated what I'm going to say now. So now given a function on the interval to R, uh, satisfying that its values at the endpoints are equal, Um, it's periodic extension um, f x I'll call it from on the whole real line is the unique function satisfying uh, two properties that it agrees with f on the interval. And the other is that it's periodic. So fx is two pi periodic. Let's call this a two pi periodic extension. Now this is a fancy, some fancy terminology for something that's super duper straightforward, which is literally, if you have the real line and you have a function from minus pi to pi, for example, the absolute value function, and you and you know that it you know that at the endpoints it has the same value. Then you can do this sort of obvious thing, which is just copy it forever. And then you'll get a two pi periodic function. So in this case, the function f is here, and the function f x is defined throughout. Okay. So you've already seen, in fact, this, this, is a, this function here actually is the periodic extension of, um, of, a, of the second example, actually. So this is hx, the zigzag is hx. And the step function is uh, gx. Uh, sorry, okay. Yeah, to, to get gx, I have to put zero at these points, okay. So. So let's just be careful here. So zero, you get zeros at all the jumps, right? So, so this one is gx. Now, you know, the point of thinking of it this way is, if you have a, now a two pi periodic function on R, then if you have a Fourier series for you know the function a function on the interval and it agrees with the function on the interval, then just by copying it a bunch of times, it'll still continue to agree on the real line, right? So, so what's the consequence? So I'll write the, of one simple consequence of the convergence theorem, which is really not a new theorem, it's just a restatement. The consequence is um, uh, if, so one is if f in v pi satisfies um, uh, f of minus pi equals f, or actually, you know, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just write it for periodic functions. I'll just, so the consequence is uh, if f is two pi periodic and uh, uh, both f and f prime are piecewise continuous uh, on, or actually I'll just say are, are, are continuous uh, on this interval, then the Fourier series of this function equals the function for every real number. 
So this is not really a new theorem. I'm just saying you can copy that convergence theorem across on the whole real line if you have a two pi periodic function. And now let me show you a visual demonstration and then I'll give you an audio demonstration after that. So let's, but any questions about the statement? Okay, so 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 let's see a demo of this because it's it's honestly a little bit hard to believe when you first hear about it. So um, so we're actually gonna. I, I found these animations online of the uh, two functions we looked at. So this is this is going to be uh, the Fourier series of pro approximation of the the periodic extension of the function g. Which was like a bunch of squares. So let's let's. Oh wait, I have to optimize for video, I guess. Mm, yeah. Okay. I hope I don't get copyright infringed for this, but okay. So this is just uh, you know, I guess uh, sine x. Right. It's the height of a thing moving around. Now this is the next term, which I guess was sine three X over three. So you had a circle of radius, a third of the original one and superimpose it. This is the sine five X term. And you know, the whole point of this is if you choose these weights, this is sine seven X. If you choose the weights carefully, you can superimpose these waves in such a way to make, you know, this shape. And yeah, you, you can keep going like this and you see that you get very good approximations of this function. And okay, I mean, so any questions about this animation? So, so you know, this Fourier series is telling you that you can always do this. Sorry, is the video quality getting worse, really? Oh. Yeah, it's getting more and more pixelated. That's bizarre. Okay, let's try a different video. I think when you first shared it, uh, it, it it came out good, but now like your entire screen is pixelated. Wow. Um, okay, maybe my internet is. Oh, let me turn off my Dropbox. That'll that'll probably help. Uh, okay. Oh yeah, I think I know what's happening. Yeah, so there's Dropboxes. Um, oh yeah, I think it's doing some horrible thing like syncing this video to the Dropbox as it's being recorded. So, um, wait, so how do you, okay, this new Dropbox interface is really annoying. Um, Okay, I'm just gonna quit. Yeah, okay. And then, okay, here's the other example. Uh, second example. Um, this is, I guess it's called a saw wave. So it starts with this, uh, I guess, I think it has a little shift, but it starts with a cosine. And then, okay, this has music too, I guess, but okay. <laughs> um, and the point is if you choose these weights correctly, you can generate a completely different shape. So, okay, so th the point of the theorem is that you can always do that. And, uh, you know, there's even an app online where you can just, uh, you can just play with this and like put in your own sound and see what it does, right? So for example, here's a sign. So, okay, what is this picture showing? On the top, it's showing some periodic wave, which is a, you know, a periodic function. 
And then on the bottom, it's showing its sine and cosine coefficients. So for sine, only there's only one non-zero coefficient, which is sine itself. And then everything else is zero, right? Because sine of x is just one sine of x plus zero cosine of x. So if you can hear this, so it sounds like this. Okay, fine. But now you can, you know, you can try the things we tried. So this is a square wave. And you can you can kind of you know you can slowly build it up. So this is the first coefficient. If you had the second coefficient, this is zero because remember the odd ones are zero. The next one. And uh, and you know you can you can, this is the other one right so the full sound is, is this it's a horrible sound actually um, like it's showing you how to build up the sound you can build Represent these sounds as sums of these pure tones that are sines and cosines. Um, and uh, okay, that you know, this is actually kind of the basis of like MP3 and like all kinds of audio compression. That you basically take the Fourier series of the song or whatever, and you just throw away the low coefficients. You just keep the top few coefficients, and it sounds pretty much the same. So, any questions about this? Okay, this is on the website. You can you can play with this. Um, and yeah, I mean, okay, like so. There's a visual demo. There's an audio demo. And you know, I mean, really, okay. There's this article I shared on the web page, which shows, uh, you know, what um, what this is, and and they use this analogy of like, this is the same as like when you play a chord on a guitar. You can, so right. So if you, so if you play, I mean, okay, I'm learning how to play the guitar right now, so I'm, I'm not very good. But if you, um, uh, let's see, let's see. So if you, so okay, if you know if you know a bunch of if you know a bunch of notes, you can play a chord, right? So okay, does anybody know what that is? Which which chord is this? Uh it's hard to hear, but it sounds like an E chord. I can't see your hand, though. Uh, yeah, it's an E minor chord, right? Yeah, OK. So um, so now, so an E minor chord is a superposition of like three notes, right? So what notes are these? I don't actually remember, but <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just starting to learn. So OK, somebody else has a guitar. Good. <laughs> Yeah, E, G, and B. Okay, so this is E major, this is E minor, this is E major. But now the point is, you know, if I just play, if I just play a chord, then if you just hear the chord, the question is, can you, can you, um, can you tell me what the notes are, right? So can anybody? I mean, it's pretty hard to hear, but but, but what chord is this? Okay, my, as you can see, my guitar playing is not very good. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, perfect. F, F, or F major. Like, yeah, it's F really major good. chord. Yeah, or you know, you can play all these different chords, and you know the really the the point is that the the Fourier series, um, which really is kind of the basis of a lot of musical theory, actually. Uh, that's not a. Um, that's not just that's not something I'm making up, right? So like a G major chord. Is is what like G, B, and E? Is that correct? Anybody? Uh, okay. Excuse me. Repeat. Okay. Since since I don't know these things off the top of my head, I cheated and looked it up. So okay, here's a table that tells you what all the chords are. 
And the point is chords are just superpositions of notes. And what the Fourier series does is it, it recovers this, right? So literally, if you were to record what I just did and take the Fourier series, it would it would tell you this, right? That a chord is a sum of notes. And in the demo, we were saying that you know some sound is a sum of you know pure tones. And this, this you know, the, the point is that this is really saying that f of x is equal to a naught over two plus summation a n cosine n x plus b n sine n x. So it's like a very visceral thing. Um, okay, so that's the convergence theorem. So any questions about that? Professor, um, I think a lot of people have seen like random black bars on your- Oh, okay, let me change that. How about now? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Okay, so that's the convergence theorem. So let me now tell you some cool applications of Fourier series, which also answer a question that was asked earlier. Um, okay. Okay, so one application, which is really useful, is something I'm gonna call automatic differentiation. Okay, so let's look at our two functions that we looked at earlier. Um, so we have, g of x and h of x, right? So we have this step function and this absolute value function. So let's just recall them and their Fourier series. So we have g of x, which is equal to this. And we had uh, h of x, which is equal to this. And we had their Fourier series, which were equal to the functions, by the way, by the convergence theorem. And the first Fourier series was, let's look it up. It was um, four over pi times these signs, right? So these odd signs. And the, the second function was also equal to its Fourier series. But this was a little bit different. This was this pi over two minus four over pi times cosines. So let's write that. But then you had these squares. Okay. And so now you could ask, well, what's the relation between these two Fourier series? Right, so any thoughts? Anybody see any relation between these functions? So this is the absolute value function. Anybody see any? So remember, this is plus one up here and minus one on the other one, on the other side. Is it a derivative? Yeah. So the function h is not differentiable at zero. And OK, it's not, the derivative doesn't really make sense at the endpoint since it's the end of the interval. But if you, you know, repeat it, it's not differentiable at the endpoint. But everywhere else, the derivative of h of x is equal to g of x everywhere except at zero plus and plus or minus pi, right? 
Now that's a fact that you you need to know you know you need to know some basic calculus to do that right the derivative of x is one derivative of minus x is minus one, but now watch this. Let's say if you take the derivative of the Fourier series. Well, so that's the derivative of this infinite series. Let's do it term by term. Sorry, cosine. Okay, and now watch what are these derivatives? Well, derivative of constant is zero. Derivative of cosine x is minus sine x. So you pick up minus sine, so you get a four over pi. And now you get cosine x, one times cosine x over one squared, and now plus three times, Sorry, not cosine sine. Plus three times sine x over three squared plus five times sine x over five squared. And well, that's just the Fourier series of G. Shouldn't it be sine three x and sine five x? Of course. Sorry. Yes. Right? So this is not an accident. So you know, the, the point here is that if you can take Fourier series of functions, no matter how complicated, and we just said you can take a Fourier series of pretty much anything, you can automatically differentiate it because the differentiation reduces to differentiating sines and cosines. So this is how later in life you differentiate functions that are really hard to differentiate, right? You you write the Fourier series and you differentiate the Fourier series because differentiation can be hard, right? So this general differentiation theorem, I'll call it, and what it says is, under some suitable conditions, you can differentiate Fourier series term by term. So let me just uh, say what that is. So if f f prime and f double prime are piecewise continuous on this interval minus pi to pi. So that just means you're ignoring finally many points. The function is, is uh, differentiable, it's twice differentiable, and both of those things are continuous. Uh, and uh, f of minus pi equals f of pi. Uh, and it has a Fourier series. then you can automatically differentiate the function just by differentiating the Fourier series. And the Fourier series of the derivative is just what you would get if you differentiated the sines and cosines. So it's summation and goes from one to infinity. And so you get a minus n a n uh, sine n x plus n b n cosine n x. Okay, so the way people talk about this, you say this means you can differentiate term by term. So this, I hope this answers the question that was being asked earlier that, uh, you know, uh, It, you know, it seems that you can differentiate sines and cosines very easily. Why can't you use that to differentiate any function? Well, the answer is you can. And you know, this isn't, um, uh, yeah. So I mean, okay. In this particular example, actually, the function I used is actually not twice differentiable. Oh, sorry, it is. It is okay. That's the point. It is p 
piecewise, it is twice differentiable except at finitely many points. So that's why this works, yeah. Except at zero and the endpoints, these assumptions are satisfied. So any questions about this? So yeah, I mean, you know, for example, in, if you use software to solve differential equations, often what it does is it takes, instead of looking for the function, it looks for the Fourier coefficients of the function. And then it turns into a differential equation involving sines and cosines, and then things become easy. So this reduces calculus to cal calculus of sines and cosines, as long as you can do integration, as long as you can compute Fourier coefficients, which is not always easy, but you know, it's uh, the fact that something like this exists is not obvious. Um, okay, let me give you another application. Um, so uh, the, the second place this comes up a lot is in, uh, in uh, uh, you know, so far many of the applications I've given you are kind of very um, uh, sort of applied applications to the real world, to like music and images and things like that. Um, but but you can use it. You can use a Fourier series to prove many important mathematical identities. So, for example, in the 1700s, there was something called the Basel problem, which is the following problem: What is one plus one over two squared plus one over three squared plus one over four squared. So this problem was open for, I think maybe close to a hundred years. So this is a legitimate question, right? What is the sum of reciprocals of squares of the integers, of the positive integers? So it turns out we can solve this using something we already did, right? Anybody have an idea of something we did that could be used to solve this question? Would we use the theorem which can extend a Fourier series um, over an interval and then calculate between negative pi to pi and then just extend that, maybe? Um, so, so I mean, okay, so the, the extension, the, the whole point of the extension was to be able to visualize functions on minus pi to pi as being periodic functions on the line. Uh, it didn't really say anything new about the Fourier series, right? It just said that the Fourier series of the function converges to the function. Um, do you have anything maybe more specific idea? One of the Fourier series had like basically those terms, but multiplied by cosine something. So if you solve it at zero, maybe. Yeah, it's a great idea. So we already derived this Fourier series, right? And by the convergence theorem, this is equal to h of x, right? Now this this is this is uh, to show you how powerful this identity is. The right hand side is easy to evaluate, right? So at x equals zero. What is h of zero? Well, it's just zero, right? That's easy. And what is this at h equals zero? Well, it's pi over two minus four over pi and cosine zero is one, one over one squared plus one over three squared plus one over five squared dot, dot, dot. So, okay, fine. I messed up a little bit. <laughs> the question we actually solved is what is the sum of reciprocals of the squares of the odd integers? So I should have asked that. That's not actually the Basel problem. It's kind of close, but it's not the same thing. But let's change the problem. The, getting all the integers is also possible, but it's a little bit more complicated. Well, okay, the answer is, is just here now, right? You, you just plug this in. These have to be equal by the convergence theorem. And so from example two, you get, 
you get that, uh, let's see what we get. You get that pi over two minus four over pi times these numbers. One plus one over three squared plus one over five squared dot 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 equals zero. And then that implies that the series equals, so if you rearrange this, you get pi squared over eight. I mean, this is a stunning identity, right? The sum of reciprocals of the squares of the odd integers is pi squared over eight. Is this where they got the solution for like the counting for, for the sum of normal integers? Or uh, yeah, of yeah. So th there's a way to do the regular integers using this as well. It's a bit more complicated. The answer for all the integers is pi squared over six. But uh, you can use this to do that also. So can also get summation one over m squared. And a lot of other number theoretic identities. So I should mention there's a, there's another problem that's been open for, I think at this point, 300 years or 400 years, is what happens if you take the cubes? Wait, um, quick question. Yeah. So when you say they're open for like 100 years, 300 years, like when were they solved, so to speak? They were never solved. Nobody knows the answer to this. So this last question is still nobody knows the answer. I think it's, I think three, yeah, three is the first number. Let me just check. Either three or four, but I think three is not, is still not known. Sorry, sorry, of, of a four, four. Uh, so three is known. Um, four is not known. Okay, maybe four is known. Maybe five is not known. I think I'm, I think I'm confused. One of these, one of these is not known. Uh, let's check. Oh no, I was right. The exact value of the exact value of the, of one of the cubes is not known. So this is so this is still not known actually. If you solve this, you'll be well, you'll be famous and and so on. But anyway, uh, so that's another kind of application of Fourier series to solving problems in number theory essentially. So any questions about that? Okay, um, let me now tell you, so let's see. Um, yeah, I wanna do one more thing, which is kind of, it's kind of just a little, it's not a deep thing at all, but it's sometimes useful. And it's used a lot in engineering, so I thought I'll just tell you about it. It's called half interval series. So, okay, so what was the summary of Fourier series? The summary of Fourier series is that, you know, any reasonable function can be written as a sum of sines and cosines. That's one way to think about this. Any sound can be broken into pure tones, et cetera, et cetera. It's all kind of the same thing. Wait, what do you mean by any reasonable? I mean any function in V pi. Okay. So this means in V pi, right? So piecewise, F and F prime are piecewise continuous. But now you could ask, uh, I mean, another question, which, uh, which is maybe seems a little bit stronger which is what if you only want sines? Or what if you only want cosines? So what if you want F equal just a sum of cosines? 
these won't be a n, these will be some other constants. Let's call them cn. So is there a way to make this maybe even a little bit stronger um, and just get cosines? So here, so it turns out you can do this. You're given some function f on now zero to pi to r. So let's draw a function. So now this is zero, this is pi. And let's say this function looks like this. Okay. So now I, let's say I wanna express this as a sum of cosines, right? Now, uh, let's um, uh, let, 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 let's do what's really kind of a, a cheap trick here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to consider something called the even extension. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a function f even extension to be f of x on zero to pi and is equal to f of minus x on minus pi to zero. So what that means is I'm going to reflect this across the line. That's supposed to be the same. Okay, let me, let me draw a nicer function so I can reflect it accurately. So a function maybe looks like like this. And now if I take the even extension, okay, uh, you, you get the idea. I'm just reflecting it across the line. Okay. I feel like I might actually draw better with the glove. Anyway, okay. And now, uh, you can always do that, right? So this is now defined on the bigger interval, on the full interval, right? So now um, you have an even function on the full interval. What can you say about its Fourier series? What's it going to look like? Right, so normally it looks like this. But because f even is even, right, so this is an even function. on this original interval, what can you say about the Fourier coefficients? All the sine coefficients are zero. Yeah, the sine coefficients are zero. And just to be clear, these are the Fourier coefficient of the extension, right? Not of the original function. But now by the convergence theorem, this is equal to f of x. Okay, let's assume it's continuous, right? I want to avoid the technicalities of the discontinuous point. And so this identity is true on, sorry, this is F even. Let me draw it in red. This is true on the whole interval, right? But what does that say about F itself? Is it that same series, but just on zero to pi? Yeah, because f even, you know, is just an extension of f, right? So in particular, f of x is equal to the same series. Okay. 
where again, these ANs are the co Fourier coefficients of the even extension. So this seems this is a cheap trick, but it actually works, right? So any questions about this cheap trick? Wait, um, why did the signs go to zero? Well, remember the Fourier coefficients, right? The Fourier coefficients are defined using certain integrals, right? Here in this box. Now, if a function is even, then that function oh, okay. time sign is odd. So the, you know, it's shown in this picture, right? That if a function lives in this subspace, its odd coefficients are going to be zero. Okay, got it. Yep. Okay. Similarly, let's say I wanted to do only signs. Any ideas what I would do? The same thing. No, if I if I did the same thing, I would just get the same answer. I'd just get cosines. Did you make an odd function? Yeah, you could make an odd function. So that would just be you take this and now you reflect it. On the other side, you define the minus mirror image, right? So whatever it takes to be odd. So this would be something like this, right? So you define F odd. To be F of X on zero to pi and F of uh, minus F of minus X on minus pi to zero. And now this is odd, uh, similar reasoning. gives that you know f odd is e just equal to a sum of signs. And then of course the same thing follows for f itself. So this you'll do some homework problems. This is section 10.4. It's just a minor thing, but it's actually kind of useful. It's not a deep thing, but it's also a good way to practice exercising uh, with even an odd function. So any questions about this? Okay, so I want to end on sort of somewhat, well, uh, I think really amazing connection. The answer is why is this true, right? So we just saw that this set of functions, cosine and x, zero to infinity, union, sine and x, is an infinite orthogonal basis of uh, you know this set v pi right that's that's effect it's in quotes because we didn't define what infinite orthogonal basis means but that's effectively what the convergence theorem says right any function in here can be written as an infinite sum of these functions and you can compute the coefficients using the projection formula now, why is that, right? It, so it seems I didn't prove the theorem, right? And so you might wonder like, okay, is this really connected to what we learned in the course? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you why this is true, but I won't do the details because they're beyond the course, of, uh, the scope of the course. So the, the answer is actually related to the spectral theorem. Okay, so recall, so this is chapter seven that if A is an n-bind matrix, A equals A transpose, then uh, the eigenvectors of A uh, are an orthonormal basis or form an orthonormal basis of Rn. We didn't quite prove that either, but you saw part of it, right? So remember the theorem, if you have a symmetric matrix, and its eigenvectors always give you an orthonormal basis. So now, 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that there is an infinite symmetric matrix of which these things are the eigenvectors. Okay, so consider the following linear transformation, second derivative, going from the vector space, let's say twice differentiable functions on minus pi pi to itself. This is twice differentiable. Okay, what are its eigenvectors? What are the functions so when you differentiate them twice, you get back the function? Anybody know any func functions like that? Exponential. Uh, exponential, okay. Sine and cosine. Uh, sine and cosine, okay. E to the power of some constant times x. Right, right, okay, so, um, yeah, okay, so so exp exponential of some constant times x is a function, sine and x is a function, cosine and x is a function, but let's say I also insist that the function is equal to it at the two endpoints. I can throw that into the vector space, right? Then this goes away. And these are the only, you can check actually, these are the only, I mean, actually you can prove this using what we learned in second order differential equations, you know, these are the only solutions, right? Sine and cosine. Because the characteristic equation here is R squared, um, I guess, uh, yeah, R squared minus, Wait, I'm a little confused by this. Um, okay, I, I won't write the characteristic equation, but certainly if you differentiate this twice, you get this, right? D by dx squared equals, so you differentiate once, you get a cosine, you differentiate it again, you get a sine, so you get minus n squared. Okay. So these are these are actually the eigenvectors, and what you learn uh, eventually. I mean, I only learned this in grad school, but if you take, I guess, math two twenty four a, which I often teach, then uh, you get that this operator, this linear transformation, is symmetric. And then by the infinite dimensional spectral theorem, you get that the eigenvectors have to be an orthonormal basis. So of course we won't be proving this, but the point I'm trying to make is that Fourier series, while it's, you know, it's, 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 it's some kind of calculus looking idea, it's really just changing to an orthonormal basis, a different orthonormal basis of sines and cosines. And the reason that thing is a basis is because of the spectral theorem. Because there's lurking in the background, there's some infinite symmetric matrix, in this case, second derivative, which has these things as eigen, eigenfunctions, eigenvectors. So anyway, this is all eventually connected to, to chapter six and to, to chapter five and seven. But uh, yeah, I guess that's the last thing I wanted to say. Um, or maybe, okay, maybe, okay, one, Okay, it's annoying to end on this remark, but uh, remark, everything in Fourier series uh, works for any interval like this, just replace cosine nx by cosine nx pi over L and sine nx by sine nx pi over L. So anyway, that, that's it. That's all I wanted to say about Fourier series. And let me end by showing, by playing a video, which you'll, you'll see what, um, so this is a video of uh, a two dimensional Fourier series. So a bunch of those circles of different sizes being used to draw a figure. And we said you can do 
you can draw anything with it. And uh, I mean, yeah, you, you'll see what you can draw with this, but but that's, uh, anyway, that's it, that's all of course. Uh, there'll be a review session, of course, next week, but yeah. Any questions? Um, I have a question about the differenti differentiation theorem. Uh -huh. So as the definition says, it does it mean like we can, th this can only apply to the e Yeah, can you say it again? Uh, yeah, it, it is about the differentiation theorem. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like the definition says this theorem can only apply to the even functions. Oh, no, no, no. It's for, uh, it's applied to periodic functions, not even functions. So the way I wrote it. Uh, no, sorry, this is just at pi, right? This is not for every x. Oh, 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 oh It's at okay. the endpoints, the values are the same. So the function doesn't have to be even. Oh, yeah, oh, okay, I see, thank you. Yep. Any other? Thank you, Professor. Yep. Nice. Thank you. Uh, one more question about this. So this theorem is just saying that we can differentiate the functions part by part, not like, so the example you gave us, like the hx is the derivatives of the gx for in series. It is just by accident. Oh, uh, no, it's not an accident, right? So the theorem is saying that this ha this will be the case. Right, so if you have a function that's differentiable and twice differentiable at all but a finite number of points, like these h and g, then if one is the derivative of the other one at all but a finite number of points, then the same thing will continue to be to be true for the Fourier series, and you can recover the Fourier series of the derivative just by differentiating term by term. Um, so what what um, cares? Characteristics should these two functions have in common? Uh, they should the f f prime and f double prime should be piecewise continuous. So all that means is you can ignore a finite number of points. In this case, three points, and these functions are differentiable and twice differentiable. So that um, they are one of the is the differentiation different the derivatives of the other because. Um, each term of it is the deriv derivatives of the, the other? Uh, no, no, no. One is the derivative of the other except at zero pi and minus pi just by doing calculus, right? Like h of x for negative x is just equal to minus x. The derivative of minus x is minus one, right? And h of x for positive x is equal to x. The derivative of x is plus one. So indeed, oh. except at zero, the derivative of h of x is equal to g of x. Okay. Oh, I see. Thank you. Yeah. And the point is you can mechanically reach the same conclusion just by differentiating the Fourier series. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. Uh,